Welcome to the Natural Podcast. My name is Aaron Cambridge and today we have a special guest with Mr. Tucker. Nice to be here. Thank you, Aaron. I hope you're all having a nice day and having a wonderful time, are you? I am indeed, yeah. It's not been too bad today. The lo- uh, lovely weather outside and it's almost Friday in two days. So yes, we get to go home. Soon. Exactly, soon. get to go home. Soon. <laughs> Food, sleep and R&R. I have no idea what that is. Real, uh, relaxation and rest. Oh, okay, yeah. I didn't know that, but I do. <laughs> so today what we are going to be discussing and having a chat about in general is um, random facts about animals. Some are really interesting, some you might find interesting, some you might know, some you might not know, so I hope you learned something new today. Heck yeah, let's get into it. So the first thing we are going to start off with is something called the Emu War. Oh, come on then, tell me about it. What is the Emu War? The Emu War is a war that happened in Australia. I will now go oh Well the emu so are emus native to Australia? Yeah. Yeah they're Yeah, they're indigenous species, they're not invasive. So what was the whole war about? Why was it a war? Because what I'm picturing is people just sort of punching emus in the face. That did not happen. It was more like <laughs> a firefight. Okay. Elaborate. So the emu war was a war that took place in Australia, we already established that. Yep. Basically, what it happened was there was a horde of 20,000 emus. That's a lot of emus. That due to, uh, I think it was a hot summer day or something like that, um, they were forced inland where all the farmers were. Yeah. And so they started munching on destroying and well, destroying all the crops as a result. Okay. So the farmers turned to the government. The government then came up with a plan to... Um, Eliminate the threat. Fight the emus. Yes. So they got the military involved. Right. And they went to fight the emus. Wow. Okay. So when you say fight emus, I mean, what, what are we talking here? Are we talking like machine guns on like helicopters or like pea shooters or swords? They mainly um, used um, guns. Yeah, I think they might have used artillery. I'm not entirely sure about wow. that. I can't have yeah. been a pretty sight. So they mainly use machine guns, and they also use smaller firearms, such as um, rifles, pistols, and all that. Right. And, um, no, I don't think they use helicopters, but they <laughs> use um, they use the cars. Cars? Yes. Uh, like battering mil- ram. Mil- well, yeah, to catch up the emus, because they're really fast. <laughs> See, if they had sort of taken initiative, they could have domesticated the emus, and have like the emus fight the emus by Australian emu back riders, like in Star Wars or something. That would have been yeah. quite quite the sight. Yeah, I'm guessing that didn't happen. Imagine having emus as speeders. That would be epic. Exactly. Yeah. Now we're talking. Yeah, but that did not happen. So yeah. why did it? Was it a win or was it a lose? What happened? Who was the victor? Unfortunately for the Australians, very embarrassing loss. Okay. Why I can you know I sort of picture it, but why embarrassing? So what happened was, um, the emus, um, they had really, they had a lot of feathers and um, they, they had a lot of muscle mass and all that. Yeah. Because they're really big birds. Huge. They, yes. They are, well, smaller than ostriches, but you get the idea. Yeah. They're, um, I can imagine very big birds, very intimidating. Every birds. single shot fired at the emus did not kill them instantly. It did not take two shots. It did not take three shots. It took ten shots. Okay. Tough Which birds. you can imagine became very expensive for the government to supply. And embarrassing. Yeah. You have 20,000 emus that you got to kill, and you have to kill them with 10 shots each. Yeah, and I mean, what? when did this take place? What year? It took place in 1938, more or less in a later, year, later part so of the year. So, more. Almost at the start of the war, the Second World War, and I can imagine munitions. Not easy to come by, thus expensive. Well, well, we aren't really on the um, we aren't on the Western Front of the Second World War because no. it has not started yet. It's not no. opened up yet. But being sort of not modern equivalent of the um, industrial boom. Well, back then the equipment that you would have then was most likely the uh, modern equipment that we, you'd have used. All right. Okay. Uh, modern tactics, which we still use some of them as well. Speaking of tactics. That's the that's the next point of the emu war. Okay. The tactics that you that used constantly changed during the war. 
they went from ambush tactics, which what they did. How do you surprise and ambush a bird? That a very large that bird. was the problem. Yeah. They um, travelled in large groups. What they would what, have emus or Australians. Um, emus, <laughs> sometimes Australians, but not skilled emus. Right. So what they would have is they would have um, the emus would be feeding. They would be like circular groups. And then, so what you'd have is the emus feeding, and then um, you'd also have emus looking out, like, over the areas to keeping an eye on things, making sure they, they don't get attacked. Which eventually they do, because remember, this is a war, after all. Yeah, I mean, wow. So the ambush tactics um, would have failed. Every time the groups of Australians got close, every time the military got close, um, well, not every time, but a lot of the time, um, the birds would spot them, and they would all scatter. It's almost foolproof, isn't it? Because if you have one group feeding and the other group on the lookout, all they'd have to do then is just swap over and it's, it's impenetrable almost. Yeah. Like you can't not see things as, a, you know, as an animal. And they'll be yes. very good at detecting things. The senses are a lot more attuned to what we have. Very much, yeah, yeah. I imagine. So, well, so when they get close, they would get spotted and the emus would scatter. Now they each gathered in every direction, so not only that, when you have ten bullets firing at one emu, you have to try and fire them at all the emus as po as fast as possible. And they are fast, aren't they? they? Yes, very fast. And then, basically, basically, what the thing is is you have to kill as many as possible before they all go away. Yeah, and that's not easy. And that's when things started to change. So, chasing the birds down was the next thing. Well. One of the many tactics that you use. Okay. Now about those car things that we were talking about, cars. Yeah. <laughs> vehicles. Get vehicles, whatever you want to call them. <laughs> things that have wheels. Yes. yes, a lot of things that have wheels. <laughs> a lot of things had wheels back then, even planes. Yeah. And um, they get in the vehicles, they mount machine guns onto the vehicles, and they drive to try and catch up with emus. What they do is they'll try to either segregate some groups of emus and get them into a certain area, and then just fire into the group. So kind of like how you herd cattle. Yeah, like, in, well, in a way. In, in, a way. in Australia, especially because it's so massive, the actual like cattle owners will use vehicles to, and multiple people in vehicles to actually herd like enormous actual herds of cattle. Like We're talking like 200,000 plus cows. They have to use helicopters and cars, whereas we would have, you know, little Lassie and, and some farmer from... New York or something. Yeah, probably. <laughs> Maybe even Great Britain. Yes, exactly. So they've got, they're trying to chase these birds, they've got cars with machine guns, yeah. and it's still, still no dice. The birds are fast, the cars did eventually catch up to them, but the birds are still fast and good um, pressure on the vehicles. Mm. So they fired the rounds, and remember, even with machine guns, it'll still take 10 rounds to kill each bird. Unless yeah. you get a lucky shot in the head, but obviously it's a head. Nothing can really survive a shot in the head. No, and it's one in a million. Because they have tiny heads, don't they? Yes. Most of the big birds. It's almost like they're so well adapted for this war. They know exactly what they would try and how to avoid it. That's because they'd have to deal with things like this in the wild. Do you know that's why they call people bird brains? It's because birds' heads are so small. Especially the Australians. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, especially the Australians. Way to insult an entire entire country. I like it. You have an entire <laughs> Sorry country. to any Australians. Yeah, very much sorry. But so, still, very embarrassing. It is incredibly embarrassing, yeah. And they still didn't... Like, how long did this go on for? Around a few months. It start, I think it started in October and then it ended in December. Right. So very close to Christmas when it ended. Okay. Which, yeah, you can imagine. You can imagine it being like the Falkland War. You know what the Falkland yeah. War is? When the British go against the Argentinians over some islands. Yeah. That lasted for a few months, I think around 72 days. You can imagine the Emu War being like the Falkland War in a way. Yeah, same sort of duration. Yeah. So it's a few months, and I imagine they just gave up. It's well, just got expensive. Eventually it got too expensive. Yeah. Separating groups, we already suggested that, but then, so what they'll do, sometimes they use vehicles, sometimes they just 
she had the birds get them to split apart and then shoot them again to get more into tight groups and then you just fire into the group with machine guns. Oh, so violent. It's so very bad. Speaking of which, I just so happen to have some right here for you. Fantastic. There's something about spider silk that you might like. Go on then. Spider silk is harder than steel. It's tougher than steel, stronger than steel. Yeah. I've heard that before. So what do you mean when you say it's stronger than steel? Because I imagine a big block of steel and then spider's webs. In my mind, the steel's stronger. But why is the spider's web stronger? The reason why spider silk is so fragile is because of how small it is. Spiders, you know, they're really small. They are really small. Some are bigger, but... Tarantulas. Yes, yes, very big. Australians. Yeah, they have big spiders. Yeah, very big spiders. Very scary. If so... Only, if only they could use them in the emu war. <laughs> that would have been... That's very Jurassic Park, actually. If they could have done something like that. Anyway, spider silk, stronger than steel. Why? The reason why spider silk is stronger than steel is because it you it was um hold on because I can I can see what you mean (laughs) I can see what you mean by because it's so thin in strands you don't really have that with steel so if actually if you imagine a strand of steel compared to a strand of silk actually I can now see how the spider silk would be stronger it's more elastic yes it's a more tensile now imagine that as like one cable, like let's see, you have a cable that has around a like a standard, cables. like I don't know, jack lead or something. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, yeah, that would be really thick. Yeah, that's about what four or five millimeters thick yeah. in diameter. Mm. Yeah. So if you had that of spider's silk, would that be stronger? Yes, it would. Yeah. Now each individual sh- silk or spider silk. Yeah. Yeah. Spiders are not made out of silk. Silks are made out of spiders. <laughs> you, know you, you said about, I think it's about something about proteins, isn't it? Yeah, proteins. There are individual proteins which make up the spider silk. And every single silk has a strand. Each strand, there's around a thousand strands that goes into one piece of silk. Okay, so it's, it's, and now it's there, a strand and that's And there's made multiple up. pieces of silk that right. are used to make webs. Yeah. Yeah. So... In those single strands, there's even more strands making them up. Is that right? Yes. Right, okay. So there's a thousand strands that go into one piece of silk. Right, I understand. strand of silk, to be exact. And actually, you can see how that would really, like... Yeah. ...form a a very rigid structure, if you think about it in a very sciencey way. Yeah, very rigid. Very much rigid, indeed. You can... Now, if we can manage to harvest all that, we could probably actually create a material... To, that could basically um, rival steel yeah, and Kevlar. Right. Yeah, yeah, very much. Well, what's the issue? Why can't we do that? One, because if we were to do that, we would have to put all the spiders in one location. Oh, I don't want to do that. That's and that. just farm them for the steel. Ugh, no, those, I don't. those that can can no longer produce steel, we're gonna have to kill. God. Yeah. I mean, I don't like the idea of a room that has one spider in it, let alone, like, hundreds of thousands. That just sounds like my living nightmare. Billions, to be exact. Oh, God, no. Like, just, like, one room, and then you have billions of spiders. Like, imagine, yeah, you see that light up there. It'll, it'll most likely... Um, oh, oh, that's horrific. Yeah. No, I don't want that. And there would be even more. And imagine more. if you walked into a room that had, a, like, a billion spiders in it. Do you think they would try and eat you? Well, that depends on how hungry they are. <laughs> Very much depends on how hungry they are. <laughs> After all, they're spiders. That's they horrific. Evolve. That's like Final Destination or something. And then you have the ones that lay their nests, which each nest probably has hundreds and thousands of spiders. Oh, the babies as well. Yeah, gross. Yeah. But so what you'd have to do is basically just get a bunch of female spiders, get a bunch of male spiders, get them to all to produce silk, and then when the female spiders are pregnant and lay their eggs, which you have thousands of, you have even more spiders. So eventually you can have one area overpopulating filled with spiders <laughs> no. and just layers upon layers upon layers of silk oh my god it sounds but like a living nightmare it yeah, does. yeah it does it really does it sounds like a living nightmare it sounds horrific okay yeah. spider silk awesome stuff yeah very awesome but also very gruesome to get it yeah so imagine you can't really set up a farm of spiders as you can with cows well they don't exactly produce beef do they <laughs> <laughs> that's true I'm not sure there's going to be people queuing up to have a spider steak 
Well, that kind of depends on how you taste. Well, there's some like um, uh, uh, Asian countries will consider them a delicacy, and they'll have them as actual like meals, like proper meals. They have like uh, insect noodles and stuff, like insect stews, well, which to me sounds any country great, in general gross. could do that. But you know, as part of their culture, they were raised on that. I was not. Yeah. Okay. So we've talked about spider silk. Yeah, let's talk. Let's talk about crocodile genetics. Go on then, crocodiles. Everyone, yes. tell me about some crocodile knowledge. Well, we all know about crocodiles. They're very dangerous. They're very. Deadly. Are they bigger than alligators? Or are the alligators bigger than crocodiles? Well, it kind of depends. How much they eat. Yeah, I and think. How much they um, grow their genetics in general. Yeah. Alleles. If you don't know what alleles are, you should probably be paying attention to your science lesson. I don't know what they are. DNA genes. The ah, different right, variations okay. of genes. That's what aliens are. Yeah, I haven't done science in about ten years, so give me a break. I right. had science just a few hours ago. <laughs> they aren't exactly the most dangerous creatures in the world, but they are one of the most dangerous creatures. We all know about that. Oh, they have the death roll, don't they? Yes, the death roll. Basically, what the death row is, is when they're they're sitting on up by the riverbank, well, underneath the riverbank, just basically in the water. Let's say, for example, there's a crocodile, and then we have a, an alpaca going, and an alpaca goes in to get a drink. The crocodile will latch onto its head or neck, oh. pull it down into the water, and then it'll um, thrash about, roll about, and just rip it to shreds. Is that the idea of the death row, then? Is yes, it to, rip it, to rip it apart into more swallowable Chunks. Oh right, okay. That's and then what they do is they'll just um, take a take a chunk and then just swallow it. All oh, right. I I always thought it was to like stun the animal. Maybe it does a bit of both. Maybe it stuns them, so they so they don't react. And then well, they can't exactly react when you're being rolled <laughs> in water. You're not exactly yeah. designed to uh, escape a crocodile when you're in water. No, and they have incredibly powerful jaws. You're not getting out of a crocodile's jaw grip. Yeah. Not, not in a million. Years. I think around uh, two. Thousand pounds per inch. Oh, per square inch, yeah. Per square inch. Which is like um, like gorillas as well. I think it's similar to those, yeah. but gorillas are more concentrated, whereas crocodiles will have the full range and also, of their mouth. And also, they are very fast to bite. Yes, well, they can move at like ridiculous speeds in short bursts, can't they? Yes, and I imagine 40, 50 miles per hour, I'm not intelligent. Yeah, extremely fast, but they can only do it in short bursts. Yeah. That's for us being a reptile. But let's talk about crocodiles on a smaller scale, a much smaller scale, like, let's say, an egg. Okay. What about crocodile eggs then? Crocodile eggs, you can actually manipulate their gender. Can you? Yes. To be a male crocodile, you will have to be in an egg that is 30 degrees or cooler. Okay, wow. And to be a female crocodile, you'll have to be in an egg 35 degrees or hotter. hotter. This, you can actually manipulate their gender. So you have a batch of eggs, presumably not being eaten alive by a crocodile, if you actually <laughs> get the eggs. Yeah. And then you um, bring them to an area where you can actually heat them up or cool them down, and you can, mani- you can manipulate what gender you want. How does that work? Do you know? Because um, the, the temperature will actually determine the crocodile, because they do not have a fixed gender. They do not have the chromosomes to have a fixed gender. Right. So once they're, being, so once they're actually growing inside of the egg, once they're out of that um, cellular state, they, do, they can't really have a... Okay, so is it just something that's on a biological level that when it detects it's colder, it's like, you're going to be a boy? Yeah. Okay. And if you want to put it like that, yeah, sure. Is there a so, reason that the colder is boy and hotter is a female? That I'm not sure, and I'm not sure many people know. No, I, I can imagine that's an enigma. Very much of an enigma, an anomaly to be precise. Yeah, it doesn't really make sense, does it? Yeah, Crazy, I didn't enigma. know that. Crazy. Yeah. And um, yes, yeah, so basically what we can do is we can take them to the lab, and if, oh, there's a shortage of male crocodiles, better cool down the temperature and make more male crocodiles. Or people are approaching too many female crocodiles and killing their eggs. Let's make more female crocodiles so there's more eggs. That's kind of like a, a life hack. I imagine it'd be like one of those TikTok videos. Like, life hack, if you want a boy crocodile, put it in the freezer. Put it in the freezer. <laughs> You'll probably kill the egg in the process. Yeah, but... Yeah. I don't think TikTokers really think that far, to be fair. Yeah. <laughs> Anything else? 
Well, I actually got some really interesting questions for you to answer. Go on, then. So, did you know the snails have blue blood? I did not know snails have... Why do they have blue blood? So, you know how, um, let's say, um, you um, accidentally had a cut yourself with a knife while you were cooking. Happens. Yeah, yeah, happens. I think everybody's gone through that. Yeah, multiple times. Yeah, my mother especially. Yes, it's... I'm very accident prone, but yeah, I cut myself open, red blood comes out. Yeah, red blood comes out. The haemoglobin is what gives, well, is what oxygen binds to the blood cell because they do not have a nucleus, so, so there's more space for oxygen to bind to blood. That's how they move oxygen around your body. Yeah. I'm, I can't exactly pronounce what the other word is for blue blood, but I, yeah, I don't know how to pronounce it, but it's... <laughs> Hermel something, I'm not sure. Yeah, it'll be, it'll be something, Hema or Herma, something like that. It's always the same words for blood. So, yeah, blue blood, which grabs oxygen, and, yeah, um, yeah oxygen is transported around the body. It does. And our next question. Is that why my veins are blue until I bleed and then it's red? No, I don't think it's that. It's oh. mainly because of the colour of the veins, not because of the colour of the blood. Oh, okay. Maybe the tissue or something and the next thing I want you to do, go on then. Next contemplate question. Contemplate or try to figure out would be, how many hearts does a squid have? How many hearts does a squid have? Like a human has one heart, an animal has one heart, some animals may have okay. more hearts. Okay. Okay. They have six legs or or tentacles, not legs. Squids, don't they? So I would say six hearts. They have three. Three. Why three? The thing is with squids. That may not be completely accurate about this, but you know, squids, they're underwater and they go really deep underwater, like maybe 500 to 1,000 feet deep below That's the really water, deep. Yeah. Where basically you have no light and the water pressure, just in, like imagine 10 elephants standing on your skull at the same time. That's a lot of pressure. I'm not sure. Per I'll centimeter squared. That. Per yeah. centimeter squared. Or God, good. Wow. Yeah, that's incredibly. So they're going to need multiple hearts to help push yeah. blood around the body because with one heart, it'll just simply... Right, enough. so it's a matter of blood pressure. Yeah. So one heart just wouldn't cut it, basically. Yeah. Okay, wow, didn't know that. And did you know that the condition, if the conditions are not right for a snail, they, they, may, they may hibernate into a, a state of hibernation. Yeah. Maybe sometimes they're not like that long, maybe like a couple of minutes, a couple of days, maybe a couple of months. Like, you know, just average hibernation. Yeah. And then you get to really, really ridiculous stats where they can hibernate for three years. You know, I actually, I can believe that because I've seen, like, in my garden shed, snails in the same place for months or years, and then their shells disappear, but they're not on the floor. Yeah, not on the floor. So I assume they've escaped at some point. It's like... At some point. Kind of unbelievable. At some point. How, do they, how would they like maintain moisture and everything? I don't know. It's crazy. My guess is, is that once they're in their hibernated state, they will start conser- conserving what moisture they have. Yeah. They will um, stay inside their shell for God knows how many months. Yeah, my tortoise might, might be like that because he hibernates all the way through winter up until the sort of beginning of summer, the end of spring. And I think I found a snail in my car, um, like a few days ago. There was like a snail on like the door handle of my car. Cool. <laughs> yeah, it's basically a Nissan, but yeah, it's just there. That that's why. <laughs> yeah, because it's a Nissan. Did yeah. you know? Um, oh, I forgot the car company, but they made a car. Called, oh, oh, it was a French one. I think it's Citroen. They made a car called the S Cargo. S Cargo. Which is French for snail. Snail. I yeah, know. and the car looked like an actual snail. That I did not know, and yeah. that I hope I never see. <laughs> and that is what we will end on for the podcast, I think. For now. For now. For now. We will have another special guest at some point. Yeah, at some point. Um, so, until then, it's been wonderful to sort of chat about yes, animals in the yes, emu war. very much. We hope to see you soon. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Very much. And I hope everyone at home enjoyed the podcast and learned something new today. Stay safe. See you later.
Hello and welcome back people. Today we are with Jacob, who is a special guest. Why don't you introduce yourself? Hello, I'm Jacob. I'm a student at ISCO Academy. Yeah, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. You see. So, um, last time we've discussed, um, well I think you know by now, but we have discussed about the emu war. We've discussed about, um, yeah, very stuff. Um, oh, this, I love the emu war. <laughs> yeah, very embarrassing. Very embarrassing. We have talked about spider soak, crocodile eggs, we also done some random facts and stuff about snails, and sharks and pollution. And today, um, I hear you got some some interesting stuff for us to tell. I do. So, I've been doing a lot of research into the biotechnology that we'll need to use to colonize Mars. Biotechnology. Biotechnology. And so the thing is, as we venture further and further into space. So many problems arise for different colours of biotechnology, colours being the categories of biotech, namely green and white. So green biotechnology focuses on the agricultural aspects, while white focuses on using uh, sing single cell organisms and really, really small organisms for medical purposes. And here's a quote that I really like. It's by uh, Bill Stegewald from NASA in 2008. Take the cold tolerance of a bacteria that thrive in ice. Add the ultraviolet resistance of tomato plants growing high in the Andes Mountains and combine with the ordinary and combine with an ordinary plant. What do you get? A tougher pioneer plant that could grow in Martian soil. Now, this is the goal for so many NASA scientists working at the moment to find a plant or to design a plant that we can use for nutrition when living on Mars. So some of the bacteria that we've been looking at, so the idea is we're going to take the genome from these bacteria and tardigrades and fungi, take the genome and splice it into the DNA of your average plant. May I ask, how exactly will you uh, splice it into its DNA? Okay, so in order to get, in order to get the gene that you want, so may it be uh, the gene that produces uh, the protein CAHSD, which is what makes uh, tardigrades so amazing at resisting sort of cold temperatures, space, dryness, um, and space, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I've really heard about them. Pressures. Yeah, I've heard about them. They're really, really resilient. Oh, they are. They're yeah. amazing. Like, uh, can you, like, can they, like, resist a nuclear bomb if it went off? Pretty much. So, how a tardigrade sort of resist, well, how it is so extreme, extremophilic is it floods its cells with this protein called uh, cytosolic abundant heat soluble D. Now what this protein does is it floods the entire cell basically encasing everything else in this sort of hard ra radioactive resistant sort of scaffolding. Now the gene to make that happen um, is called CAHSD producing protein, uh, sorry gene. Now the way that we get this gene out is we well, it sounds a bit gruesome, but we mu we mash up a load of tardigrades. Um, oh god, yeah, sure, that does sound gruesome. <laughs> yeah, very gruesome. Now, essentially what we do is we extract the DNA using the experiments that many high school students are doing at the moment. I did it about about two weeks ago. We did it. Yeah, yeah, yeah you were in my class. Um, I remember we like um, did it with uh, peas. Yeah, with peas. Yeah, now, like... We um like just mash them up, put them in some liquid and some ethanol later on once those um heat up a little bit. And exactly. Get DNA. And so as we poured the ethanol in, we saw this white DNA precipitate yes. out the solution. Well, I saw like a white film. I'm not sure what you yeah. saw. <laughs> uh, I saw the same thing. Okay. So because peas only have two chromosomes, they don't have many. They don't have much DNA. However, if we put sort of a tardigrade, um into that sort of process instead of a P. Tardigrades have over a hundred chromosomes so we'd see much more DNA. 
So what we do is we filter out the DNA from that, just picking it out with tweezers or maybe... Tweezers? How the hell are you going to pick a DNA with tweezers? They're microscopic. So, well, all DNA is is a really long strand. So as you pick it out, it all clumps together. Yeah, so yeah. you put this into a water solution um, and mix the water solution with something called a buffer. Um, and also the thing that will bind to the DNA to replicate it inside of a PCR machine. So what a PCR machine does is it essentially cuts open the DNA using an enzyme called helicase and then it, and then it binds a messenger RNA to that and then it copies the messenger RNA and does the same process over and over again. So that replicates the gene that you want. So once you've mapped the genome of a tardigrade, which we've done, mm -hmm. what we're able to do is create this messenger RNA that will bind to this DNA and then capture this gene that we want. Now, what we can do is take that gene and mix it with sort of cell, uh, cells of a plant, maybe just injecting it into the roots um, inside of a virus called an AAV. Now what this virus, so viruses, what they do is they get inside of your cell and replicate their own DNA. And then you like destroy the cell once they exactly. have no use for it. Yeah. Exactly. So what we can do is utilize that by putting the gene inside of this virus, giving it to this plant and making the gene replicate inside of the plant. So essentially we can make a Radio radioactive resistant plant using these AAVs. So that's going to help um, plant life grow on Mars, like terraform. Exactly. Yeah. So although that may take a few thousand years. <laughs> well, yeah. the terraforming is, a planet is one thing. The yeah. thing is, we might not even need to terraform it. We can design plants and animals and even humans to live on Mars. And we've actually done this. Um, mice were injected with CAHSD at day zero and given a second injection at day 21 of the experiment, sort of designed to mimic a vaccine booster. And over the 28 day monitoring period, CAHSD was recognized by the mouse immune system following injection. And the immune system elic elicited anti CAHSD antibodies inside of the blood at higher levels than normal. But they didn't break the CHSD down because the mice, they'd basically never seen it before. So what they did is survived. The mice survived with the CHSD in their blood. So what this proves is that we can put this CAHSD, which protects from radioactive sources, it, it protects the proteins in your cells from deforming under radioactive conditions. Now, this is insane. This is a major scientific breakthrough, and it's so fascinating to me. May I, may I ask something? Of course. There is, um, so let's say, for example, you have um, a mice. Now you've already proved that a mice can resist that, but what about its immune system? It's some, what you're injecting is something foreign, something that its immune system might not be able to, well, definitely won't um, tolerate, so it's going to try and push it out. Well, and this is what we've shown. We've shown that none of the mice died due to the CHSD, and despite the antibodies being produced by the mice, it didn't have an effect, and none of the mice died. It. This is a massive breakthrough in genetical modification and also we've done this with plants ex uh, plants, and then afterwards exposed them to high doses of alpha radiation and gamma radiation um, and they survived and flourished in it. It's amazing. I would like to point out that gamma ray radiation e can easily rip apart DNA like just a, a thousand degree exactly. knife going through butter. Exactly, and this is so amazing because we've learnt to resist that through 
bacteria called um, Deinococcus radiodurans, um, tardigrades, and even this radiotrophic fungi that grow in Chernobyl and on the outside of the ISS. I've heard about Chernobyl. Mm. Very bad thing. Now, Ukraine. Yeah, it was a disaster. But for Ukraine. But what we've learned from it is immense. I've. I've done some research into this radiotrophic fungi that live around the ra- like the highly radioactive area of Chernobyl and are able to survive and even use this radiation as a power source a power to source. grow. Like it's, what do you mean by that? Like can you explain that? So on April 26th, I think 1986 um, the town of uh, Pripyat, um, which is where Chernobyl was, uh, experienced a s- sort of a big power outage um, just as a drill. And due to sort of an operator error and flawed design, the reactor overheated and went an uncontrollable chain reaction. Now, using using robots to explore this area once once all of the sort of um, heat has died down and we know that it's relatively safe for robots to go in we've discovered this bacteria and this uh, so sorry not a bacteria a fungi that grows around the reactor core now what what it does is it has an extremely high content of melanin which is what makes people's skin dark what makes you tan in the sun and what's in your eyes like gives you the color of your eyes exactly um so this melanin what it does is it when when it takes in gamma radiation an electron jumps to a higher orbital and then this and then this extra energy which has been absorbed is passed through sort of a transport chain and then it is used to make energy for the plant to grow. Or not the plant, the fungi, but it's theoretically we could use it in plants. Mm-hmm. It's amazing. And because the cosmic microwave background radiation is so lethally high on Mars, because it, it completely lacks like, an atmosphere. Yeah, it's, um, I've heard like a, a, a while ago, like maybe um, like a few billion years ago, I think it was. Um, Mars core solidified and it had no mag- didn't have much of a magnetic field anymore and yeah. so the sun just brushed its atmosphere away. It pretty much, that's exactly what happened. Yeah. Um, and now because it's subject to such high doses of radiation, um, I believe it's approximately 411 photons per centimetres cubed. Damn, that's a lot. It's, it's high amounts of cosmic microwave background. And how many radiation. photons are there per centimeter cubed here on Earth? Sorry. How many photons are here on Earth, like per centimeter cubed? I'm not sure, but it's it'll be way way lower because we've got such a thick atmosphere, and even as climate change progresses on, it's making our atmos- atmosphere thicker and thicker, and so. It's, I, I would make a guess and say about 15 photons. Now compare that to 411 photons per second per centimetres cubed on Mars. It is insanely dangerous. But what we're doing is we're taking these genes, putting them into plants and maybe even humans to make us live on Mars. Now this will be the future of space exploration and I cannot wait for it. Well. I'm sorry, but I think we might have ran out of time today. Oh, that's, that's okay. Thank you. You've heard it, fo- you heard it here, folks. Space exploration with microorganisms with Jacob. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. I hope you all have a nice time, and we will be meeting lastly with Caden Farmley. Have a nice time, and just have a nice day. Bye-bye. Okay, hello, everybody. Um... So today I will be talking about some animal facts that I have found out recently, or found out in the past, or just find interesting and want to let some people know. Um, so I have a list in front of me here today of some an- of some facts that I have um, learnt over the years, um, and thought some people might be interested as am I. So the first um, fact that I have for you is one that I actually found quite interesting. Um, so I'm not too sure what causes this. I'm sure it's different depending on the animal, but um, I have found out that uh, the gender of animals sometimes can depend on some things and others. 
for example, with uh, with uh, crocodilians, um, the uh, temperature of the eggs will actually depend on the gender. I'm not too sure what the temperatures are, but I do know that if it is a certain temperature, then all of the eggs will be female. If it is another temperature, then all of them will be male. Um, so that I find quite interesting. And uh, for example, with red deer, uh, red deer hinds are females, stags are males, and fawns are babies. Um, the red deer hinds, um, it actually depends on the health of the pregnant hind to what gender they will give birth to. Um, so if it is a healthy hind, they will give birth to a female fawn. If it is a unhealthy hind, then they will give birth to a male fawn. So I find that quite interesting. I'm wondering the reasoning behind it. Um, uh, I would assume that if it's because uh, if the hind is unhealthy and gives birth to a male, then when the male grows up, it will be more able to protect, considering it will have huge antlers. Red deer antlers, I think, are one of the biggest in comparison to the body of any deer species. Um... So, a bit of protection, and also, uh, it's more common for them to be healthy than unhealthy. And obviously, due to uh, circumstances and how they breed and how they work, it is better for the, much better for the population if there are much more females than there are males, so it's probably to keep the female numbers high and the male numbers low. Um, okay. So, that I found very interesting. Um, also, um, so, um, I heard the other day that uh, manatees... Um, I heard someone refer to them as a mermaid, and I was very confused. But um, so apparently, uh, the uh, the person who discovered manatees and saw them for the first time, uh, it turns out when he first saw them, he actually thought that they were mermaids, um, and 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 uh, he actually made a an entire um, diary um, entry about it, um, uh, stating that he was a little disappointed, but um, a mermaid, a mermaid, so he wouldn't complain. Something along those lines. So, all I know is that he was just disappointed by how a mermaid would look. Um, also, uh, manatees' vaginas, I think, are the most atomically accurate to a human's vagina than any other animal. So, I don't know. Maybe, eh, I don't know. Um, right, anyway, moving swiftly on. Um, oh, uh, so... Okay, so here's where it comes to really strange stuff when it comes to money, because now what you see, we get a lot of people in the world who spend a lot of money on something that, in the end of the day, will probably not be worth it. Um, people who are of higher classes tend to spend their money quite loosely, or more often than not. Now, this might have something to do with spiritual things, because I know that a koi carp can be a... Uh, I know it is to do with religion, koi carp, but I I think it's something to do with um, peace or um, just like tranquility, just like a nice aura to have, I suppose. So uh, you would uh, pick a koi carp that you feel suits you and then you would buy it to have in the house. And also you would have paintings and things like that. But uh, this one koi carp on auction sold for 1.8 million British pounds which is just mind-blowing for a single fish. So, yeah. Um, also, uh, the, uh, deadly, the deadliness of sharks today, I think, is very much overestimated. Uh, sharks are, in my opinion, incredible creatures who shouldn't... Although they should be treated with respect, I don't think they should be feared as much as people fear them. For example, um, so 52 people die per year by just deer... And um, 150 people per year die from coconuts. But only 10 people die per year from all shark species worldwide. You are more likely to die on the way to the beach than you are to die from a shark attack. Um, something else that I heard about the other day is a, is a uh, dish um, served in, I think, China called Dancing Squid. The reasoning for the name is, so uh, there's a species of squid that they will serve as food. They would serve the tentacles, mainly, and uh, from what I've heard, they taste okay. Um, but uh, it is always tradition to uh, sell them with uh, soy sauce. So you can pour the soy sauce on the um, tentacles. Now, this is very important, because obviously when the tentacles are severed, they are already dead. But um, when uh, you pour soy sauce on them... Uh, it reacts with the muscles within inside the tentacles, and it causes them to contract and react, and 
act to all sorts. So uh, you often get, as the name suggests, the dan dancing tentacles. You get a dancing squid, even though the squid is technically dead. To the point of they can like jump off tables, and I think around three people per year die from choking on dancing squid. Just because the tentacle practically chokes you whilst you're trying to eat it. Also, um, speaking of muscles, uh, so it turns out in an uh, elephant's trunk, there is around 40,000 muscles in one African elephant's trunk, which is insane. Um, because each muscle rea um, contracts and reacts differently to, you know, make different positions and do different things and, you know, it makes the trunk more stronger to where it's got to the point of an elephant's trunk is just one gigantic like hand finger that they can use to you know grab things i'm sure you know it's also the reason why baby elephants have such trouble um controlling their um trunk i know that for elephants it's uh, like a huge learning curve to learn how to use the trunk properly um and because baby elephants just cannot control it properly you'll see them like flailing around and stuff and they have trouble controlling it because well they're babies and they're trying to control over forty thousand muscles at once Oh, and uh, the uh, Irritator. So, um, uh, so in case you don't know what a Spinosaurid is, um, you might have heard of a dinosaur called Spinosaurus from Jurassic Park 3, or you may have just heard of it from somewhere. It is a basically a gigantic dinosaur, uh, around the size of a T-Rex, with a long elongated um, snout and a um, spine for a back. Well, it has a big sail on its back. And, um, and, uh, any dinosaur that has like a long protruding snout and um, and has teeth with something called the uh, lockjaw method, which is basically the teeth are deliberately rigid. Um, so when they grab onto things, it's more difficult for them to wriggle out. Um, crocodiles today have the same thing. Um, any dinosaur with that, they are um, they are classed as a spinosaurid, and one of the spinosaurids is a um, dinosaur called Irritator. Now, when scientists um, first found a bone from Irritator, they knew that it was a new species, but they didn't know what the dinosaur looked like because it was just a piece of vertebrae. So they couldn't tell that much from the evidence, but uh, they went digging for years to try and find a different piece of this Irritator, and they finally found another piece that at least was different, but it, again, it didn't tell them anything, and they couldn't guarantee it was from Irritator. And then they finally found a third piece that, which was, I think, part of a skull that ge that gave them the piece that they needed to say, "Hey, this is a spinosaurid. We can at least guess what this thing looks like." It took them many years, and and it it, it it irritated them a lot. So, given the name Irritator, so when it came to naming the dinosaur, they named it Irritator just based on how difficult it was to get a rough idea on what this thing looked like. And uh, something else that I um, actually found quite useful, actually, is um, so quite a lot of people have trouble differentiating between cheetahs and leopards. Now, although there are other ways, for example, cheetahs are much more fragile and delicate and skinny when leopards are more just big, bulk and heavy. But uh, what I find is the easiest way to tell the difference is uh, the simple phrase, cheetahs cry black ink. Although this isn't true, it can help a lot with differentiating them because if you look on the markings on their face with leopards, it's mainly just yellow with black spots. But with cheetahs, it's yellow with the black spots. But they also have a um, have long lines of um, what looks like black ink going from their eyes to the sides of their face. Now, the phrase cheetahs cry black ink it makes it much easier to tell if it is a cheetah because you just look at the markings on the face. If there's two black lines on the face going from the eyes to the bottom of the mouth, somewhere around there, then it is a cheetah. Uh, I know the reason why they have this is to uh, help their vision over the savannah plains. I'm not too sure how it does it. I think it might be something to do with um, um, absorbing sunlight or something to do with that. But um, I know that the uh, black lines below their eyes uh, help them focus on things and help them see in the um, hot days in the African savannah much better. Um, also, um, so there's a lizard that lives in deserts called a thorny devil. Now, these guys are interesting for two reasons. Uh, the first reason is uh, whenever they are in danger, they have a habit to um, squirt blood out of their eyes. So they, um, 
uh, I'm not too sure how they can do this, but I know that they can uh, produce quite a lot of their blood through their eyes and squirt it, like, um, they can aim it quite well. They can squirt it directly at predators to confuse them and hopefully to make them get deterred and hopefully leave or run away. And the second thing is now Thorny Devils, they're quite a small lizard, but um, they live mainly in uh, desert-type areas. So there's not a lot of water, and water is very precious to them. So they have evolved wrinkles in their skin to where if they find a pool of water or just like a damp area where the water is too shallow to drink or something like that, they can just stand within the water, and then the water will eventually and gradually make its way up the wrinkles in its feet, up the legs, and then um, alongside the body, up its neck, and then into its mouth. So... If it just stands in a pool of water or even on something damp, then the water will eventually protrude its way up the um, up the grooves and then towards the mouth, and then it can drink that way. So it's like a water delivery type thing. Also, uh, the most fastest growing organ in the entire animal kingdom belongs to the moose. Uh, moose antlers growth is 20 inches in every nine days. Now, that may not sound like a lot, but that is just completely out of the world. That is insane. That is a lot of growth, and it is for a good reason, because the moose during the mating season can get very, very aggressive. Um, so the competition gets very high very quickly. Also, uh, they shed each year. So um, moose antlers, in case you didn't know, this happens with all species of deer. Their antlers every year will fall off, and each year they will grow back a little bit bigger. The ones that call off people usually refer to them as sheds. Um, also, uh, in case you haven't heard of something called asexual reproduction, it's very interesting because uh, some lizards like Komodo dragons, some invertebrates like worms, and some sharks like hammerheads all reproduce asexually. So, um, uh, well, not all of them reprodu reproduce asexually, but it's something that they can do. So, uh, asexual reproduction is where um, you only need one animal to make more, basically. So, uh, for example, um, how people found out about Komodo dragons is um, a zoo had a, a female Komodo dragon within an enclosure. Uh, she has never um, come in contact with a male in her life. There are no males within the vicinity. There is no way she could have come in contact with a male. But then she laid eggs, and the eggs hatched and gave birth to more Komodo dragons. Now, uh, asexual reproduction is basically um, you don't need a sperm cell and an egg cell from two separate individuals. You only need one individual to be able to reproduce and create more of your own kind. Um, also, uh, there are two species of mammal that lay eggs. Um, they are called mono monotremy. They're called monotremies. I don't know if I'm spell I don't know if I'm reading that right, but monotremies. So um, uh, now a lot now a lot of people know of one of them, but people only think that there's one in the world that's alive today, and that's the platypus. A lot of people have heard of platypi, and a lot of people know about the fact that they are mammals that lay eggs. But there is also another one called the echidna, which uh, also lives in Australia, and it's uh, referred to as the uh, Australian hedgehog. It's about what you would expect, apart from it's, I think, closer related to anteaters than it is hedgehogs. So, a very small, spiky, hedge, um, very small, spiky anteater, I suppose, is what you should imagine for the echidna. Uh, I, I would actually suggest researching them. There's a lot more that's interesting about them, but I wouldn't have enough time to go over it all today. Uh... Oh, um, also, uh, there is a very uh, inter interesting species of animal. Um, it's, I think, the third smallest animal recorded in the world. Uh, it's very microscopic. Um, they're called tardigrades. They're also known as water bears. They are incredibly resilient. Um, one of the most successful animals in the entirety of the animal kingdom. Uh, um, so water bears are given, so tardigrades are given the nickname water bears because they have to live in water. They rely on water su to survive. That's where they live. They live basically anywhere in the water. There's two different species, one that lives in like lakes and ponds, and there's the other one that lives in like salt water, so seas and things like that. Um, but something interesting is that although, although they require water, uh, they can actually survive without water for 15 years. They do not have to eat 
or drink for 15 years. And the reason being for this is because if you take water away from them, what their body does automatically is that they will wrinkle and shrivel and become as incredibly small as possible. They will deliberately crush all of their organs, and they will, um, if they already weren't small enough, they will become even smaller, as, as small as they possibly can, to where it isn't even recognizable as an animal. Um, all it looks like is, is just like a flake of dead skin, that's it. And then, uh, when introduced to water again, so if you give it water again, before 15 years happens, then the tardigrade will um, begin to build its body back up um, within a few hours and then just get on with whatever it was doing in the meantime. Um, so yeah. Uh, they've also uh, got two backwards legs. So they have uh, six main legs. Oh no, wait, uh, four main legs in the front and then they have two more legs in the back that are backward facing. Uh, that's good for, well, as you'd expect, walking backwards. Also, uh, something that was quite interesting about blue whales is that, um, of course, as you know, blue whales are huge. They are gargantuan. Um, and uh, something that a lot of people don't realize is, so if you ask somebody, uh, what's the biggest animal that has ever lived, they usually think dinosaurs. So they will say something like Brachiosaurus, Brontosaurus, Tyrannosaurus Rex, T-Rex, or something along those lines. Um... But actually, uh, blue whale, not only is it the biggest animal alive today, but it's the biggest animal to ever live on this earth, or at least as of we know. It is the biggest creature ever recorded. So, still bigger than anything else, it's still the biggest. Um, and their tongue, so, so the tongue alone weighs 2,500 kilograms. That's 2.5 tons. That's like two and a half bulls like it is un it's it, it, it's impossible to comprehend how big these creatures are and how they can even support their own weight even though they're in water it's it's, it's just it's just mind blowing um so i found quite interesting um also speaking of the biggest um animals uh uh the polar bear is actually the largest land carnivore alive today um, which I found interesting that a lot of people don't really realize, because a lot of people think it's the grizzly bear. But the grizzly bear is only the third biggest, next to the brown bear and the polar bear. Also, polar bears have uh, transparent skin when... No, not transparent skin. They have transparent uh, fur. So, a lot of people think they're white, but that's just because they're in a white environment. Their fur, are, their fur is transparent. Um... Also, uh, going back to the platypus, uh, they actually have a sixth sense... So, uh, platypus, when they go underwater, when they dive to go and search for food and prey, um, uh, they actually, uh, shut their eyelids and they just go underwater, just blind, so they do not see when they go underwater, but they have a sixth sense for whenever they're underwater, it is, uh, located in the front of their bill, um, it is, uh, it, it's essentially a, uh, type of sonar, to where, uh, even though their eyes are closed, they can still detect um, where things are by producing a noise and then have the noise bounce back off that thing and then they can locate the creature. Also, uh, there is... I, I'm not sure the name of this chicken, but uh, there is a chicken that is completely black in every single way, shape, and form. Uh, now, uh, I, um, I think it's because of uh, melanin. Um, melanistic is... Um, is a uh, type of a variation or mutation that uh, certain animals can get, which is basically like albino, but opposite. So instead of being born pure white, they are born pure black instead. It's called melanistic. It's the opposite of albino. And I find it quite interesting. Uh, some um, It reacts to some animals differently. And uh, there is a species of chicken that's all black. So if it is with melanin, then every single one is melanistic. And uh, when I say it's pure black, it's literally every, it's literally everything. So it's what you would expect. The feathers are br the feathers are black, uh, the feet are black, the skin is black, the eyes are black, the eggs are black, the actual meat is black. So so if you had this chicken for a roast, for example, the meat will just be like a deep inky black, even though it is perfectly safe to eat. And um, also with uh, octopuses, their IQ is much higher than most people would believe. 
because uh, sometimes some scientists say that uh, if we turned all octopuses into humans to take an IQ test, they would outscore most humans on the math portion with a genius level scoring of around 140, which is insane for a marine creature that spends... The, 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 they, they don't even live that long. They live for a year at most, and the females actually die when they give birth because... So the females, when pregnant, they will go find a little, like, crevice where no other marine creature will find them. They will lay um, thousands of eggs on the ceiling, and then they will just stay there and sit and then deliberately starve themselves to death. So when their eggs eventually hatch, they can feast off their mother and then go do the same to other things. So uh, their mother, when they hatch, is, like, free-starting food. Uh, I know um, a lot of species of spider do the same thing. Also, um, uh, pigeons actually give milk to their young. Now, when I say give milk to their young, uh, uh, it uh, it's, uh, isn't for any nipples or anything. Uh, the way they give milk is actually by regurgitation. So um, what they would do is they will eat, you know, as usual. And uh, I think it's through their stomach acid. Um, a uh, reaction will happen to where um, pigeons can actually um, store a kind of form of milk. Um, and uh, when their eggs hatch, they can regurgitate the milk into their chicks' mouths. So their form of food for their chicks is actually a type of milk. It's called pigeon milk. There's actually a, a Polish food that, uh, that uh, if you translate the food into English, um, it's called pigeon milk. It actually tastes pretty good. Um, then there's uh, kiwi's eggs. Now, if I say kiwi's eggs and you're thinking of the fruit, I'm not talking of the fruit. Uh, there is a bird that lives in New Zealand called a kiwi. You've probably heard of it a couple times. Um... They're very interesting creatures, but um, they have an uh, interesting pregnancy because, um, so uh, the egg for the kiwi, so they're a type of bird, and with most birds, they will have a clutch of eggs to where they will have quite a few eggs, Uh, some will not make it, some will, and when they hatch, they are very, very, very not not independent, they depend on their mother a lot, so they have to sit in the nest, and they have to be fed, and so on and so forth. Well, Kiwis approached it a different way to when they basically thought, instead of doing luck of the draw and having a bunch of kids and hoping one survives, what if we put all of our energy into one egg, but make it to where that one egg has a much better chance of survival? So that's what they did. So um, uh, Kiwi eggs, in, in comparison to their mother's body, it is... It is disturbingly huge. Like, they are gigantic. I think they have one of those painful pregnancies in the entire animal kingdom. Um, uh, uh, to the point of it gets to where uh, around three days before the egg is actually laid, the female uh, cannot eat or drink because um, their liver or stomach can't just cannot hold it in because um, their egg is, uh, is, is uh, obstructing the space. And... Uh, pushing it, um, pushing the stomach uh, up against the wall of their body. So they are unable to eat for three days before they lay the egg because the egg is just obstructing everything and they also get difficulty breathing and so on and so forth. Then when the egg is finally laid, if the female survives it, um, the benefit of this is when the egg eventually hatches and the bird is hatched. Unlike other birds where they are mainly helpless, kiwis don't make much of a nest and when the kiwi hatches, the kiwi is only like although it is an adult the kiwi once hatched it is very much closer to maturing than most other birds and they are much more self uh independent so the downsides is it is very difficult to pull off but once you pull it off the the chick that hatches is much more likely to survive And uh, something that I found out the other day is, um, so there is a cult that, they they seem pretty nice, they seem pretty okay, where uh, they are all very very nature friendly, and they're they're, they're very ocean based, they always like the ocean, they they do like a lot of like uh, uh, beach cleanups and beach runs and clean up the beaches of all the rubbish and things like that. But uh, something else that they're doing is uh, they are trying, they are trying to... Um, make plans to make a literal lobster god called Leviathan. They're going to name it Leviathan Lobster God, and the reason for this is, um, so I'm not sure why, but uh, the what they're planning is um, so lobsters, whenever they uh, shed um, their uh, exoskeleton, 
um, they will grow a little bit bigger each time. But uh, the but it it depends on the environment around it, how much it grows each time it sheds its exoskeleton. If the environment's perfect, then it grows a lot. If the environment's rubbish, then it only grows a little, if anything. Um, so uh, what this cult has done is they've just got a few lobsters. And every time they shed their exoskeleton, they're going to attempt to make the conditions as perfect as humanly possible in hopes to one day... Dan uh, this is going to be like a, a, a generation thing to where like, one lobster will be passed down for generations uh, to get for people to look after to quite literally make a lobster god that will just be gigantic. How big it will grow to, I'm not too sure, but... I just know they're going to try and make it as big as humanly possible, and it's called Leviathan. I know it's got something to do with them wanting to, like, take over part of the ocean or something. I'm, I'm not sure. Um, also, with lobsters, they have one of the rarest um, uh, skin patterns, I suppose you would call it, in the entire world. Um, they're called Halloween lobsters. I think it's roughly one in one billion, I think. Um, uh, the Halloween lobster is a lobster that's born with a genetic mutation where it's colouring. There, it so so with most things in nature, as far as colouring goes, it it's kind of like random-ish. But with Halloween lobsters, there is a very very symmetrical and very very perfect line going down the very center of the um, lobster's body, and on one side it will be like a bright orange, and on the other side it it will be like a deep inky black. So uh, it's called the Halloween lobster because. Well, orange and black are the color themes of Halloween. And uh, now we get on to hybrids. Now this I found very interesting we're looking into. Um, so we'll, we'll, st we'll start with the not so interesting and we'll end with the very like, what? So um, something that people, a lot of people don't know is ponies are actually a hybrid. Because when people think of horses and ponies, people usually go, oh, they're the same thing, just different name. Um, no, uh, no uh, turns out a pony is a hybrid between a donkey and a uh, horse. But since we're talking about hybrids with donkeys, uh, there's another hybrid with a donkey called a zonkey, which, as you can guess by the name, uh, people have hybridized zebras and donkeys. Then there's the liger, which once again, suggested by the name, is a, is a hybrid between a lion and a tiger. But something interesting with these is when they're born, they are born with a terrible deficiency to where they do not stop growing. And they, technically speaking, they're the biggest wildcat in the world because they're much bigger than tigers and lions. Um, but the downside is that it's obviously not meant to happen. So uh, they, when they're born, they're, they're usually born with all these illnesses and terrible disabilities. And the worst part of it all is uh, they never stop growing. So the main causes of these guys' death is being slowly crushed and suffocated to death by their own weight caving in on them, which is horrific. Then there's the Groller Bear, which... Um, now, this is actually to do with uh, climate change. This is uh, the first um, natural hybrid that we're going to cover. So this has happened in the wild. This has nothing to do with um, captive breeding. Where um, polar bears um, that live up in the Arctic... Because the ice caps are melting, they're being pushed further and further south to where now they're breaching um, parts of Alaska and a little bit of Canada. And uh, because of that, um, uh, grizzly grizzly bears are actually starting to go north. And uh, they've been coming across each other, and uh, and some of them have been breeding successfully. So um, I think there's only been, like, three to six, like, confirmed cases but uh, Groller bears are a thing where there's a hybrid between, naturally, a polar bear and a grizzly bear. Uh, the next one is also a natural find, but only one of them has ever been discovered. Um, it was strange that it was natural, though. Uh, it's something called a narluga. It's a hybrid between a whale called a narwhale and a whale called a beluga. They both live um, uh, up in the uh, Antarctic and Arctic, um, very cold places. Um, the beluga is a... Um, is a, a like crystal white dolphin esque type whale, just no dorsal fin, well, smaller dorsal fin. And uh, the narwhal, uh, people have nicknamed the unicorn of the sea because it has grown one gigantic tusk growing out of the left side of its face. Um, but um, once a uh, once somebody found a a pod of um, narwhal, no, not narwhals, people have found a pod of um, belugas that actually adopted a. Um, a narwhal, and a, a couple of years later, people actually found that they started breeding successfully, and they had something called a narluga. 
So that was an interesting find. Um, then there's the two really interesting ones. Now, these never worked, but it was interesting that they were ever tried. So the first one is um, a greater kudu and a reticulated giraffe actually attempted to um, have young. Now, this has nothing to do with captivity. This is absolutely nothing um, uh, to do with uh, people intervening. Uh, but uh, there was this kudu, um, this greater kudu, uh, is like a gigantic antelope um, that uh, lived in a um, a uh, protected area for wildlife. And uh, on the uh, other side of this, like great big fence, uh, there was a um, there was like a watering hole um, that a lot of animals re um, regularly went to, including a specific reticulated giraffe that the greater kudu was very fond of, and uh, the greater kudu would actually be able to jump at the fence, so they got to see each other quite a bit, and they actually created this kind of strange bond or relationship that science still can explain, and people don't know why it happened. But um, So a giraffe, the tallest land animal on Earth, and a kudu, a although it is a big antelope, it does not mean it is anywhere near giraffe size. It is it's around about the size of a horse. So, a kudu and a giraffe actually uh, attempted breeding multiple times. They never ended up with any young, but that would have been one interesting find. And the last one uh, I found very messed up. Apparently this has been attempted twice, once in the 1920s and another one in the 1960s. People tried making something called a humanzee which is a hybrid between humans and chimpanzees. No one... I'm I'm assuming they did the very typical um, thing that most scientists do to where if there's something that can be done and it's not been done yet, they must do it. So um, multiple times in history, people have legitimately tried to crossbreed humans and chimpanzees. And last but not least, uh, you might have heard of this animal before, but... Probably not. Um, something called heck cattle. Now, this is quite a story. Um, uh, I personally nicknamed them the uh, Nazi cattle. Um, I'll give the reason for the name later. So, uh, back in uh, history, um, there was a creature called an aurochs. Now, aurochs uh, is the um, original species for all cattle today. So, all domestic cows and cattle uh, originated from one species, and this one species is called the aurochs. Now, the aurochs actually lived up until kind of recently. I think the last sighting was, I think, somewhere in the 1800s in Poland. Um, but uh, uh, it was in the forest of Poland, but, well, they died out. Um, and uh, so there were these um, two um, kids uh, who were brothers, uh, I can't remember the first name, but I know that their last name was Heck, given the name for the Heck cattle, because it was them who came up with the Heck cattle. But, um, so, uh, they were very obsessed with, uh, aurochs. They really, really liked the species. And, uh, and, uh, at this point in time in history, it was World War II, when they really liked the species, and they've always wanted to see it back. And, um, they actually got in touch with, uh, um, with the uh, neo-Nazis, and, um, the uh and um one of the uh, leaders of the um uh dogfight i guess the uh, the uh, like a commander of like the air force for them um uh they actually got to talking and it turns out that's the um guy who was running that uh was obsessed with a um with a uh, like a poem esque thing um that was to do with hunting red deer moose and aurochs and elk in Poland and he's always wanted to do it, but the thing is, is that there's no longer any aurochs. So um, he actually decided to put in a lot of effort and help these two to basically bring from the dead and recreate the aurochs. Now, uh, the way they went around doing this is, um, so it isn't what you might think where they like extract the DNA from a dead aurochs and then they like create another somehow. Uh, what they did is, uh, so they got all the characteristics of an aurochs, which is like big and beefy with big, long, elongated horns, with the bulls being slightly bigger than the females, with like, and their colors like a dark brown back with like a light beige belly, and so on and so forth. And so they looked at what an aurochs was, and in detail, and then they got different breeds of cattle that they thought had these characteristics. 
and then just kept on breeding them together until they came out with a cow that looked at least something like an aurochs. Now, although they didn't get close enough to call the species an aurochs, they did actually come up with a spear with a species that was as close as they could, and the species is still around today, and, it's, and they have named it the Heck Cattle. Um, so, although it was a failed attempt, um, Nazis actually attempted to bring back an extinct species of cow, the aurochs. Um, okay, so, uh, to, uh, end off, oh no, actually, not to end off today, um, a few more things, uh, um, in case you haven't heard of a, what a spirit bear is, uh, there is a, um, type of bear, uh, that is, um, that has a random genetic mutation to where they can be born, like, fully blonde. Uh, now, these can only happen with black bears, but, uh, there's a, uh, area in, uh, America where it's actually kind of common for it to occur, but it's only in a very small area. People guess that there's only around a hundred of them left in the wild, and, uh, spirit bears is basically just a black bear born, but with a genetic mutation that make them, like, a, like, goldy blonde color. Um, I found that quite interesting. Uh, oh, also, um, I thought I'd um, talked about, um, color mutations a bit. I, I know I've talked about it quite a lot, but I find it very interesting. Um, so you have melanistic, which is what I talked about earlier with the chickens. It's an animal that's born pure black, just opposite of albino. There's albino, as you all know, born pure white, uh, with, um, reddish pink eyes. Uh, then there's leucistic, which is kind of a diff difficult one to describe. It's, it's basically an animal that is either entirely white or partially white and faded with blue eyes. So, so if you have a pure white animal with blue eyes, that's leucistic because it doesn't have the pink eyes. That's the way you can tell the difference between pink eyes and blue eyes. And then there's piebald, which is an animal that is born with white patches or white splotches where they're not supposed to be, but it is not fully white and it's not faded. So, like, defined white patches is called piebald. Um, oh, something I found out with uh, New Zealand, actually. So, for those of you that don't know, New Zealand's wildlife is all over the place in a lot of ways. It is upsy-turby. It is... It basically just doesn't make any sense, and um, and uh, because of the and the reasoning is because a lot of the animals that were introduced that are there today were introduced. Um, so every single mammal that lives wild on the land of New Zealand is introduced, other than one species of bat, and uh, over nineteen thousand species of plants were introduced. And uh, one of the mammals that were introduced that no longer live there today was the moose. So um, in the, uh, I think it was the nine, uh, early 1900s, uh, people uh, introduced moose to um, New Zealand. Um, they, they they evolved to it, actually, a, a little bit, um, evolving a little bit of a different color and more adapted to uh, um, temperate climates. Um, and also, adjust, of course, adjusting their diets to the plant life there. But they did manage to live there for a little bit, but they did not survive well, and they were very highly hunted because it was seen as a, like, the best type of trophy to be able to get a moose from New Zealand because it was such a peculiar thing to witness. But uh, people estimated that the... Fi that, so they gave it a new name. They named it the Fioland Moose. So the Fioland Moose are the moose in New Zealand. Now, um, they expected by the 1950s them to be extinct. So by the 1950s, they... They declared the Fiolan and the moose to be extinct, so they did not. They no longer believed that it existed in New Zealand. But uh, uh, in um, very early two thousands, they uh, actually found a moose shed in one of the rivers in New Zealand. That uh, that, uh, that uh, the age roughly dated back to the nineteen seventies. So we know that they did live for at least twenty years without anybody realizing. So now there's actually a bounty on moose um, in New Zealand today. And if you ever find a moose in New Zealand, then you'll get paid. I'm not too sure how much. I just know that you will get paid if you manage to get very good proof, either like a photo or a fur or just something. If you get proof that there's a moose in New Zealand, I know there's at least some bounty for it. And I think that that is it for today yeah okay 
so thank you for listening. Um, I know I probably dragged this on way longer than I should have. Um, I have a tendency to ramble. Uh, this is the first time I've ever done something like this, but I'm quite okay with talking to myself, and uh, I'm just gonna end it now. So, uh, thanks for listening, and okay, yeah, bye.